Finding top talent is tough, but the shift towards remote work, the great resignation, plus all the usual ongoing talent acquisitions have made finding the right candidate for the right jobs even tougher. What's an organization to do? Welcome to Nine Smart Solutions to Talent Shortages. I'm Jim Jr., your host. The rules for today's event are simple. Contestants alternate taking turns at the board, a board that will be stocked with nine questions across three topics, and each contestant will have two minutes to answer their questions. Who are the contestants? Well, first, let's get to the board. The board is broken up into three categories, leadership, practical ideas, and let's get creative. And underneath each of those categories is three questions. First contestant is Bruce Craven. Bruce, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, Jim. Um, I've been involved at Columbia Business School in the executive education department for over 30 years. Uh, I'm also a writer, wrote a leadership book about the show Game of Thrones called Win or Die, a recent novel set in New York in the 90s called Sweet Ride, a book of poetry. And I spend most of my time when not writing, working closely with senior executives and graduate business students. Sounds good. Contestant number two, Jason Fields. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, Jim. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Jason Fields. I'm the Senior Vice President of Frontier Communications. I've been here through the transition from back as a phone company of Bell Atlantic through Verizon to Frontier over the past 25 years. I love leadership, love uh, thinking about mentoring people, helping folks improve their career. And I've had countless opportunities to talk, to recruit talent, to expand opportunities to, to bring talent into Frontier over the past few years and look forward to participating in today's exercise. Sounds good. Contestant number three is Ed Kopko. Ed, introduce yourself. Hey, Jim. So um, I'm CEO of Bold Business. We're a global workforce solutions provider. I've worked in this field for over 25 years and have uh, provided uh, over seven, almost seven billion dollars of successful projects to clients worldwide. Uh, employees distributed all across the, all across the, uh, um, not just the United States, but in you know pretty much every country. We've operated in over forty three co countries in my career. I'm also an author, uh, Project Bold Life, about setting bold goals, and we help our clients. Uh, to accomplish many bold goals, goals through our services. Sounds great. Okay, let the games begin. Bruce, you're first up. Take your pick. Let's go with big picture, Jim. Big picture it is. The question, what can a leader do to attract and retain top talent? Well, in this very competitive environment that we have right now, I think you've got to be clear about leadership themes and organizational goals that you have. I think if there's if diversity matters to you, and I, I would argue that it should, I think you want to get that out there. I think you want to get out um, things that people are emotionally tied into, such as environmental, being proactive on environmental issues, being flexible with work from home. And above that, at the Columbia Business School, we talk a lot about values, the importance of values. Um, if you have key values for the organization, I think you want to convey those and be transparent about it. I think if you have key values for yourself as a leader uh, that might sort of uh, be visible as leadership behaviors, I think you want to convey that. For example, for me, it's very important to empower people that are reporting to me. It's also very important for me to be empowered. Um, if I'm going into a job interview and have a sense that I'm going to be micromanaged, I'm not going to flourish in that environment. So I want to hear right up front what values the organization has, what values the leaders at the top of the organization have, personal leadership, behavioral values, and I want to see if there's a fit for me. That's a, that's a great answer. Uh, next up, Jason. Your turn at the board. Yeah, I'll take a uh, look elsewhere than hire, Jim. Look elsewhere than hire. Your question is, what do you do when the candidate will it be expensive no matter where you hire them from? <laughs> well, that's a great question because in today's world, they're all expensive. If you're trying to hire talent, it's going to cost you some money. Oh, sorry, a little background noise there. 
And and lots of times you have to, there's a couple of ways you can tackle this. Lots of times you have to look internally because if you're going to get talent, it's going to cost you. So we start looking inside of our budget to think about, hey, how can we save money in one area of business or another that allow us to, to put more funding towards hiring talent? Um, you may do that through different mechanisms. Uh, one thing that I like to do is I always have my management team uh, assess their, their current teams and rank them. So you have bottom performers. So you look at it that way and say, you can like move somebody out to upgrade your talent. And the other way is that you look inside of your team and say, can we be more efficient in this area of the business or another? And so by improving productivity, for example, that'll allow you to make room in your existing budget to bring more talent in from the outside. Another uh, way that I've done this is thinking, being creative on the front end with the talent you're trying to bring in. So if you think about ways to structure their comp package, usually you have a, a compensation, a base salary, then there's a bonus structure that might be typical if you're looking at an executive or management level. Maybe there's an opportunity to look at some type of restricted stock. You bring them in with a, a signing bonus. So there's different things that you can do and be creative on the compensation side that may not be something to hit you at once. You can use it as a, like over three years, we're going to allocate this amount of money. So it spreads it out over a three-year budget. So it helps them to get more compensation in the total package. It helps you on your budget side not to take the hit all in one year. Very good, very good. Uh, next up, Ed, uh, your turn at the board. Okay, let's get creative, Jim. I'll take free up and add. Free up and add it is your question. What's a creative organizational move that companies can do to make it easier to solve a shortage problem? Okay. Well, this is something a little bit uh, about what Jason just talked about. Um, so uh, the top chart, I'd like to talk to the graphic here for a, for a moment. Let's just imagine that your leader X is leaving the organization and you've got Y and Z reporting to that person. It could be many more, but you know, you're know, you in a lot of instances, companies are going out and, and because they haven't developed well enough, uh, they're looking to fill that X position and causing you know, budget busting problems and also knowledge-based problems versus if we go to the lower left-hand corner and we, let's say, select somebody like Z who may not be completely ready to move up to X into that position, but with some extra help from the person up above and some of their uh, co-peers can, uh, can grow into the job over, over a period of months and, uh, and, and cycles. So uh, one of the moves that people can do is to say, promote below. Even if the person isn't perfect, give them an opportunity. It does send a very positive signal to the rest of the company that you're looking to hire from within and there's opportunity for growth for everybody uh, versus always going outside and saying, we didn't develop you well enough, so therefore we got to find a new leader. But more importantly, when we look at the last uh, right-hand corner there, when you move uh, Z into the position that pre the exiting X uh, had, what you end up having is possibly an easier position to uh, fill. So therefore, what you've done is you've not created a really high budget busting expense. You've given a promotion to somebody who's re really... Uh, excited about it and is going to look to knock down walls for you versus wooing somebody so aggressively and you backfill the Z position, which may be easier and net net the company is so much better off. Promotions inside a company are very popular. Well, that is a pretty creative answer. Next up, first round is in the books. Let's go for round two. Bruce, kick it off. I'm going to dive right in to get involved, Jim. Get involved it is. Your question is, how involved should leadership get in finding talent? Well, culture and leadership start, start from the top of the organization. Um, clearly, if you're at the top or near the top, you need to be involved. Now, do you have the time to be involved 
constantly with every little part of selecting people? Probably not. But you can certainly encourage your direct reports to make sure that they're conveying what's important and evaluating what's important in the potential hires. Um, in my previous answer, I talked about values and the importance of leadership values and leadership behaviors. Something else that's related to that that's also important is emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is broken down into self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. Now, the people in your organization who are going to be interacting with the potential hires, you want to make sure that they're operating with EQ, that they're managing themselves well, they're understanding the potential of the people who want to work for your organization, they're building bridges with them. And I think you want to convey that there is a culture in the organization that helps support new people and will operate um, in a very open, productive way with them. I know uh, early in my work at Columbia Business School, there was a moment where the previous dean, Glenn Hubbard, he was brand new to the organization, and he was leaving a conference center, and I realized it'd be wonderful if he actually offered a birthday cake to an employee who'd been there a long time. And I asked him if he would rather get in his limo, come back and hand this woman this cake. And he very happily did it. And it, it, it showed me how much the leadership from the top had an awareness on the small things um, and how that was going to impact me as someone that was at the organization and wanted to stay at the organization. So I think you want to be as a leader involved at the top. You're going to step away for a while and probably you're maybe going to come in at the end and woo the person, convey to them why they're important to you in the organization, uh, and just start the process off with them joining in a very exciting, energizing way. Excellent. Sounds like you're advocating a um, very uh, intense leadership presence. Jason, the ball is in your court. Uh, let's stay in practical ideas. Let's go global. Go global it is. How do you circumvent the limits of the local talent pool? Good question. It, you widen the market by going global, right? And I tell you, there's, we think about it, we're probably right at what, two years of it and then there's lots of things that the life change, right? And most of it is not good. <laughs> But one good thing that, that came out of this is the tools and technologies to work remotely and to work and not be stuck to a brick and mortar uh, location. I, I can just give you an example this morning. I was told clear my office out. So I spent three hours this morning going into my brick and mortar location and pulling all my uh, books and papers and we're out. It's going to be a remote uh, work at home or remote, remote work leave for, for me and others at Frontier going forward. And so when you think about that, um, the next piece, and this kind of goes to the first answer I give is you can go global and now we have the tools of technology, but there's also a budget piece of this, right? If you think about going overseas and going globally, your costs are the fraction of what they would be inside of, of a local location, especially a brick and mortar location. A perfect example of this is I've used a bold business for years to help me with contingency planning. And recently we, we had a location where a union contract comes up and now we have to, to have a plan of people staffed and ready to go. If there's a strike, all of a sudden, the you know, bold business steps up at a fraction of the cost was able to set something up overseas. So they handle the, they're skilled at this, right? They're, they're handling the location, the equipment, the access, the training, and it makes it easy on someone like me who's trying to set up something, not have to be an expert and going global, that you can partner with somebody and take advantage of those opportunities through a great resource. Excellent, excellent, sounds good. All right, next up, Ed, your turn. Okay, we'll get creative again, Jim. Moneyball. Okay. Money, Moneyball it is. Ed, how can a company apply Moneyball strategies? All right, well, I love baseball and I have in the past uh, actually required uh, uh, my senior team to actually read this book. It was published, uh, you know, in the early 2000s. And uh, it's uh, just a great book on not just baseball, 
but uh, most importantly on on talent management because if you think about sport teams the most important concept of a sports team is their talent their their athletes and how you put a team together to perform and win is really crucial so billy bean uh broke the mold a few years back because he became the equivalent of the budget beast that jason referred to earlier he's working in a lower market lower cost of market uh oakland uh team and they couldn't pay the hundreds of millions of dollars that are being pay paid for players. So he came up with a new data approach. And basically what he his takeaway was is that we need to hire for the most valuable skills and not look to have somebody be able to do every single component of the skills that we want. So if you think about it in hiring a software engineer, you might need a software engineer who actually really needs to be a manager and a leader more than an actual coder. And if you spend ungodly amounts of effort making sure they're the top coder of the day and at the top of the top, you're overpaying for something that may not be as important to your organization. So Scott Hatberg here, whose baseball card was there, is a big component of the story in baseball, he knows how to get on base. And what they figured out is if you can get on base more, that is the most valuable skill a player could have. And they were willing to accept him being a little bit of a clot around first base and slow running. So think money ball and you can potentially hire with the people for the most important skills and not every skill that you think you need for the position. That is another very creative uh, answer. Thank you, Ed. All right. Round two is in the books. Round three, Bruce, you have the board. Thank you, Jim. I just suddenly got caught up wondering if my Lakers could find a way to go money ball before the season ended. But um, yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to go with mentor, mentor, mentor. Um, All right. Mentor, mentor, mentor. You know, Why? as I. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, you're saying. Go ahead. Sorry, please read the question. All right. The question is, why is mentoring a great strategic tool for talent acquisition and retention? Well, as I said, I've worked around and with teaching and, and coaching uh, MBAs, executive MBAs, senior executives for, for many, many years. And one thing you realize quickly is that, you know, the bright people, the accomplished people, the ambitious people, the driven people, the empathetic people, they all know the importance of, of coaching and mentoring. Uh, they know it when they're young because they realize that the business landscape they're entering, even with the set of skills they have, is, is set with landmines. It's going to be difficult to navigate, and they know they're going to be benefited if they are coached and mentored by people that have more experience. Uh, the experienced people who are getting towards the end of their career or maybe peaking in their career, they recognize that if they can coach and mentor younger, aspirational, talented people in their organization, those people are going to be able to move up, take new responsibilities, and then they themselves can find final ambitious goals to pursue before their careers end. Um, I, I'm saying both coaching and mentoring uh, synonymously, but I remember early on for me, I started working at Columbia right out of getting a graduate degree in creative writing. I assumed it was a temporary job. Um, my boss at the time, a woman named Marianne Devanna, who passed away shortly after that, but who I hold in very high regard, she came to me and, and offered me a job. And I said, look, I, I don't really want a job. And um, she started mentoring me and explaining to me why I not only wanted a job, but why I wanted that job in the industry of executive education. And here I am again, 33 years later. So I was very triggered uh, and connected and catalyzed, I think is the right word, by the wisdom that she brought to me at an early age. Um, and since then, I've had times where I've been positively impacted by coaches um, mentoring, I've seen happen often. Mentoring is when people in an organization are helping other people. Um, it clearly is a powerful way to retain people and to bring people into your organization. Excellent. Next up, Jason, you have the board. Let's close out practical ideals with uh, the automation imperative. 
All right, the automation imperative. How can automation improve your search for talent success? Yeah, you know, we have another digital tools and uh, technology that just continues to improve and increase every year. And one of the things that, uh, that you'll see is using assistance and automation will free up your talent. If you think about the, the issues you have with talent, sometimes you bog them down. They're doing repetitive tasks. They're doing things that take time that it's underneath their skill set, but it's part of the role where somebody's off and they're back feeling behind them. So automation can do several things. One is you think about a bot strategy, an RPA solution where you can come in and have assistant bots help an, help an agent or help a, a manager to do their roles in the repetitive task. You can also use RPAs in an, in an unattended mode. So you can bring in uh, virtual assistants that can sit in the background. And you, we've seen in our business that we can usually set up a bot that will take three to one. And you think about it's the easy math, right? You, a person works three, uh, eight hour day. Well, there's three eight hour days in the 24 hour day that we live in. The bot doesn't care. It can work through those days. So you can start then trimming off those functions that are uh, less skillful to allow your talent to be more free and to do more things. And also to increase their productivity. There's so many things out there today on agent assistance side. You, it starts by, if you have a company like ours where people are calling you for assistance, they have problems with the repair. You put things up in the app, you put things in, in the IVRU that allows the customer to self-help. But those things then in an omni-channel experience come down to the agent. So the agent starts at halfway through, three quarters of the way through a workflow versus having to walk through that whole experience. So you're speeding up the process and that's where that force multiplier comes in in today's world. Excellent, excellent, excellent answer. Um, next up, final question, Ed, you have the board. Okay, I guess I'm gonna clean the board off with the last available question and let's get creative and that's called Free agent temptation. Free agent temptation it is. Why should paying up for a free agent be avoided at all costs? Okay, well, um, I alluded a little bit to this in my previous answer, but um, basically when a company breaks of the mold and pays up, it causes all kinds of problems. One superstar on a team creates a, 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 a almost a two two different kinds of classes of people. Uh, some of the sport sports teams have suffered with some of that type of thing, and it's the same thing here in uh, in business every day. So the first lesson is stay away from it because it creates a bad culture in the business, and is actually in many cases sometimes considered a failure of senior management not to build their farm systems properly and build people for success. And it's an admission that we did not do our job properly that we have to hire and pay uh, budget, budget busting numbers. Um, another example of this, which is um, the case, you know, clearly like even with uh, some of the work that we've done historically with Jason's organization in front Frontier, um, if we hire a person into a group of people that is higher, let's say an engineer, if the engineers are at X dollars and all of a sudden the next engineer has to come in X plus 20%. You might have 50 engineers walking into Jason's organization saying, why is, you know, the new guy worth 20% more than me? And you end up having such a uh, problem on your hands in terms of trying to quite to create equity in your organization for pay, pay scale and pay management that um, it, it's a problem that you can't even get away from. So hence, a lot of times what, you know, uh, uh, companies will, will do is focus on, you know, trying to develop people and hire and avoid those free agents and you get a better organization and as a result. Excellent, excellent. Well, there we have it, nine creative solutions. Uh, now I'd like to take some time for some closing, closing thoughts. Uh, Bruce, you mentioned that uh, you had another book out there besides the uh, Game of Thrones book. 
Yes, uh, Jim, it's called Sweet Ride. Uh, Bold Business uh, was generous enough to do a promotional piece on it. It's all about being resilient in New York City in the 90s. Um, there was a time there where I was a bartender in a part of New York called the East Village. And I met a lot of fascinating people and wrote, wrote about those experiences. I mean, it ties into the events of 9-11. Um, also, of course, I have my book on Game of Thrones and leadership that is out there. If you happen to use Audible, um, I did the vocal recording for that book. Um, and if you ever want to reach out to me, my website is www.cravenleadership.com. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you for participating, by the way. Jason, final thoughts? Yeah, Jim. Oh, thanks for having me on the show today. This was great. Uh, and just listening to some of the answers with the other players, I've, I've learned a lot <laughs> that I won't take back and use in my day-to-day -day business. Uh, you know, Frontier is, is growing. We, if, if you look at our history, there's a long history here, but the most recent, a year ago, we came out of bankruptcy. So we're coming out of bankruptcy. There's two pieces of that story. One is when you think about bringing talent come in, there's a lot of skepticism. So you have to be very creative. You have to be very transparent and have a plan. And Frontier is, has a plan. We're coming out, we're going to build 10 million homes and put fiber, high-speed, gigabit America is what we're calling it. So it's really exciting times. Great to be partners with bold businesses. They've helped us along the way and will continue to help us as we move forward to build gigabit America. All right. Thank, thank you for participating, by the way. Ed, final thoughts. Yes. Well, um, these are exciting times at Bold Business because what we're really seeing is a true uh, changing point, inflection point in, in the business world between the talent shortages and other uh, dynamics of, you know, technology changes, et cetera. Companies are being asked to change and uh, reorganize in ways they were, they were never asked to before with work from home and other kinds of skill sets. So we're just having a fun time helping companies like Frontier and others uh, go through some of these challenges. And uh, we're looking forward to the next few years as more and more companies embrace some of the techniques that we sp spoke about, uh, generally speaking, today. So uh, it's, been, it's, it's a fun time. Awesome. Well, thank you for participating. And uh, to the audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, this was Nine Creative Solutions. Uh, thank you. I'm Jim Genia. Good night.